Hundred Years' War, English, 1337 to 1453. This presentation covers the English Hundred Years' War armies from the reign of Edward III and the wars against Scotland to the English defeat at Castillon. The period is famous for the ascendancy of the English armies over all their enemies, France, Scotland and Wales, thanks to their supreme mastery of the longbow. The army adopted, not fully understood yet, deployment in Hearst based on a close collaboration between the men-at-arms and archers, which resulted in the crushing victories at battles like Crecy, Poitiers and Agincourt. Most of the army was mounted, but dismounted prior to battle. So guys, let's go now to army composition. Uh, commanders and captains is, depends on um, the rules you're using. I always use captains. I think it adds a flavor to my battles. And commanders usually if you have, uh, if you divide your army into three divisions, you need three commanders. Now, I would suggest that uh, the English should have up to 50% maximum men at arms. Uh, archers at least 50%. And depending on the battle you're fighting, allies and mercenaries up to 25%. The allies and mercenaries could be uh, uh, Gascon, if you do the Black Priest campaign. And generally speaking, Gascons were part of English armies. You can probably have Flemish uh, and in the later uh, stages of the Hundred Years' War, uh, Burgundians. So let's talk about deployment and how you should deploy the English army. The English generally deployed in a defensive position. Uh, usually they found difficult ground, uh, the flanks protected by woods or by cultivated areas. Um, men at arms were in the center with longbow men on the flanks, in the flanks uh, with in a bit inclined position. Uh, why uh, this was the deployment that the English preferred? Because the strategy was for the longbow men uh, to funnel their opponents uh, because of the continuous arrow fire uh, towards the English men-at-arms who were waiting there uh, for the slaughter. Uh, then uh, the two uh, flanks of the English longbowmen did a pincer movement and the enemy army was uh, basically encircled and destroyed uh, something like this happened, as we all know, at Agincourt. Also, something similar happened in the Battle of, of Morlaix uh, for the wars of Britain's succession. A similar deployment, but with more divisions, is the one you see now. Uh, we have uh, basically two divisions uh, and one reserve for reinforcements in case uh, that we needed. Uh, similar deployment was um, done in the Battle of Verneuil where the two divisions were commanded by the Earls of Salisbury and the Duke of Bedford. Again, you can see uh, the longbow man trying to funnel the enemy towards the waiting men-at-arms. A third type of deployment is the one you see here. It's a basic one, but uh, very uh, useful and uh, used many times. The longbow man in the front, as soon as the enemy men-at-arms were reaching close to them, they were interpenetrating behind the men-at-arms. They were gaps for this purpose uh, and then the men at arms were um, fighting the hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay, let's talk now about basing. Um, except the old days where I was using DBX and the later uh, impetus, uh, the bases I used recently were 50 by 50 and 40 by 40. First of all, you need to achieve the feeling of the unit. What I mean I mean, if you have men at arms, you need to, to show in your base that the men at arms, this men at arms fought in close soldier, were congested, were fighting shield war. If you're using, uh, uh, let's say, missile units, the missile units were more open order, not close order like men at arms. So you need to show that there is space between them. So in 40 by 40 bases, for 50 by 50, let's go to 50 by 50, you can see I was using five miniatures for the men at arms to, to achieve this effect and four miniatures for the longbow man. In the 40 by 40 bases, you can see you require one less miniature uh, to achieve the same feeling, uh, the same um, effect. Uh, regarding mounted, always I use two mounted two mounted miniatures on a base, even if it's 50 by 50 or 40 by 40. So I 
or water laboratories. But here, as you can see, examples of 40 by 40 bases and 50 by 50, I would say uh, from now on I will rebase and I will base all my all my uh, new armies uh, using 40 by 40. First of all, is a matter of economy. You can achieve the same feeling with 40 by 40 bases and you can save one miniature per base and then your armies would be bigger. The same thing also is regarding using uh, this basing system for other rule sets. Most of the rule sets I'm using have uh, bases multiple multiple of two, so you have uh, 1200 or 800, uh, you can play Hail Caesar, you can play Impetus, you can play uh, uh, many, many, many uh, rule sets because most of them use these, um, these measurements. 50 by 50 bases, they're good, you make nice dioramas as you can see on the right with um, five um, uh, miniatures on the base, but again, it's a matter of economy, but also a 50 by 50 base is very difficult. Uh, to play other rule sets. I mean, you can play any rule set if you have armies based the same, but I believe 40 by 40 bases is more uh, flexible. So what do I mean when I say achieve historical accuracy? You have photographs here of two examples of long Van, early hundred years war and late. I would differentiate this. I think the early could be up to 30, end of um, the 14th century and uh, beginning of 14th century will be the late like 1400s, beginning of 15th century. Um, there's not a big difference. You can see there is the, the, the late hundred years war, long women are more robust, they have more padding, and the early hundred years war have basically the closer wearing and uh, some chain mail. Um, this was a big difference. Also some partial plate armor that probably the long women found during the late hundred years war after uh, victories in the battlefield. So, uh, I can imagine you can use both for all eras because for sure they would have been, these are common men, uh, they wouldn't have been able to get anything elaborate unless they found it in the battlefield. Let's go now to the men at arms. I have two examples of late hundred years war and one example of early. Why? In the bottom right you see the late hundred years war, high rank nobles with full plate armor, no chain mail at all that is visible. Uh, neck pieces are full of plate armor. That's the big difference between earlier and later. It's basically the neck piece that is uh, total plate and everywhere is total plate. You can see in the early Hundred Years War knights on your right that there is the surcoats that probably are padded below, behind and partial plate around. There's a lot of chain mail. So that's the difference. But regarding the common folk, you see beside the knights you have foot soldiers and men at arms uh, of lower ranking. Um, you see on the right top, uh, it's almost the same, nothing changed, maybe different helms, maybe more chain mail, but again basically uh, the common soldier or the poor man at arm would be able to you know, take things from the battlefield and improve its armor. But again, you can use the late hundred, the early hundred years war uh, man at arms and soldiers very easily in your armies of your late hundred years war. You cannot do vice versa, but of course you can do the opposite because there would have been many knights and many men at arms and many foot soldiers that were not rich. They could find bits and pieces of uh, in the battlefield and that's how they created their armor. Um, the, the armies of the hundred years war, but the same also, also with the feudal times earlier and the Viking times, this applies in all medieval era, were very irregular. You cannot have any uh, let's say coherent army like with colors okay the french would prevail the blue colors and the english would prevail the red colors uh, because of the shields also but generally um, they were very very uh, very mixed the colors there were different uh, of course also one i think i have to point out is the shields you can see that there are more shields in the early part of the hundred years war that was very common but in the late hundred years war the shield was almost obsolete it was not used So, what I mean when I say what minis to use, in order to achieve a nice effect and historically accurate, you should use minis from all the types of men at arms and foot soldiers. Very few times knights had around them, all the other knights were very well equipped. Usually princes of the blood, uh, yes, princes of the blood, very, very, very high rank nobles even didn't have. Usually they would be surrounded by the bodyguards, who some of them were well equipped, some of them were less well equipped. So in order to make this feeling, let's see this card now, and you 
can see this card. I think it's a great example. You have to use you know, on your bases um, different types of Megatons. You can have a Noble with his coat of arms and his Tandem Bearer, and then you can have maybe a equipped Foot Soldier with a partial plate armor with some bits and pieces of armor. Try and mix them. Only, as I said, when you're portraying a very high-ranking Noble or one of the Princes, that he would have been surrounded by very well equipped Megatons. So again, here in the late 100 years war, again, try to portray the same feeling. You can see in the back some normal mana tams with padding and halberdin and some uh, mana tams and knights in the front with full plate armor. Only here you see, you know, full of banners, um, mana tams extremely well equipped. Uh, this is the Duke of Bedford. Uh, of course, his uh, prince, he would have been surrounded with very well equipped mana tams. So you can do this if you are portraying a very high rank of ranking. But generally try to mix them so they will look more realistic anyway guys this is the presentation i hope you enjoyed it our next video will be about the french thank you so much for watching and bye bye